two-time World Cup winner. And now works for TVNZ. Mel, thanks again for joining us. Look, I've still got this big euphoric high going on after being in that stadium Saturday night. Oh, 100%. I, you know, just to be part of that crowd. I've never been part of a live audience as loud and enthusiastic and crazy and supportive and happy as that. And then the style of rugby that was played, um, as I mentioned earlier, leading up to this contrasting styles, and for the Black Ferns to play like that in a World Cup final was so gutsy. Oh, my God. It was just... Just a wonderful, wonderful event, yeah. Now, that's look, I mean, there are two sides to it. Let's discuss the rugby in just a second. That crowd, you know, and I've been thinking over the weekend, trying to trying to compare it to something else. Rather than a game, I was thinking moments, and I was thinking when Grant Elliott hit that six in 2015 and the place erupted because we'd never made a one-day World Cup final, there's just a feeling of what you said, joy. And, and, I, and I haven't been to Eden Park and experienced joy that often, and yet that was exactly what it was like on Saturday night. You know, that... And that's all good. That just happened, Mel. I mean, look, the singing of, you know, to, um, yeah, with, uh, with a Ruby, Ruby Tui, you know, to, to Te Ramainga Iwi. <laughs> that just happened, right? The poise just happened. You know, I was sitting around, yeah. you know, with people who were just genuinely jumping up, singing and yahooing and carrying on, which you don't see at a rugby test. Well, it's weird because to Te Ramainga Iwi was actually brought in for um, a previous, I think it was the, the Lions. Lions. Or they yeah, the, get, yeah. yeah, the Iwis all into it, but they didn't have the personalities um, or people on the ground to really drive that. And Ruby Tui is the personality to do that kind of thing. And actually, the poi didn't just happen. They were a um, an idea produced by Hiniwahi Mohi because they were looking for something to activate the crowd. And she put that one on the table. Um, and then I guess it's the crowds that you get there. It's, it's a, a different crowd from the all-black crowd. It's younger, it's more family orientated. There's a lot more Pacific Island and Māori there because the tickets were cheap and accessible. Um, and so it was just a crowd that was going to get amongst it um, more than a traditional rugby crowd would. So, And also, there was no expectation of them winning this World Cup. And so every time they got a step closer, people were like, wow, that was just amazing. It was unexpected. And that added to that whole story arc, which was just fantastic. Mel Robinson, two time World Cup winner. With us, yeah, again, you've got so, so many issues to raise there. Look, and, I, and when you're talking about the personalities, again, they just they just seem to happen, don't they? I mean, Ruby Tui has overtaken this World Cup, and Ruby Tui is a superstar in New Zealand sport at the moment, no question about that. And I just wonder, it's no criticism, but I just wonder whether, you know, you, you don't get that fun out of the All Blacks, and whether or not we, we treat them too harshly, expect too much of them, are too critical of them all the time, and the players get a bit resentful of that. But, you know, where is that that guy that can do that, that can actually engage the crowd like that? And I, I know we've had players in the past that have had wonderful personalities and things, but, yeah, just, the, you know, they seem so far away, the All Blacks, yet the, the, the Black Ferns seem to me like you can reach out and touch them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, you know what? There are personalities like that in men's rugby. Tom Robinson's a really good yeah, example. Good, yeah, good call. Blues. But I can't, it kind of gets beaten out of them, uh, and they're told how they're meant to act and, and how they're meant to talk to the media. And then, yes, the media do go hard, and they're overly critical of them um, a lot of the time. So maybe it's time for a reset, and New Zealand rugby might have to lead that a bit in terms of internally and culturally with the team, uh, because they are quite conservative I would say because uh, they are safeguarding a legacy which they take really super seriously but safeguarding a legacy doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be serious because a legacy can be bigger than just um, a winning type of culture which is what the Black Ferns showed so but you know Black Ferns haven't just got one star they've got Portia Woodman as well who before she was knocked out she was still making yards like nobody else does on that left hand side you've got Stacey Flula who's got the biggest smile in yeah, oh, rugby. Wonderful. I mean, wonderful. Yeah. When she came off the field injured and the crowd's going ape and she's smiling, <laughs> waving. I've never seen that on a rugby field before. No one goes off injured waving to the crowd, do they? It was brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you're Sarah Hidney, who I always say is like Richie McCall, but the female modern day version of. Um, you know, the way she lifted and just started to get her hands on the ball like no one's business in the last 10 minutes. Um, amazing. So... Um, I, I just, I don't know, I really admire this team. I admire that uh, Wayne Smith also, even though he's a professor and we know he's the best coach in the world at the moment after what he pulled off in the last eight months, he actually learned from these girls about how to enjoy himself and dance and 
I went to one of their team nights and they do all these videos, um, like pre-produced videos each week, and they do skits and things. And there he is in a wig, um, dressed as a rocker, I think it was, which I thought to myself, oh my God, I've never really seen that around the All Blacks before. So just another example of how they really enjoy themselves. Yeah, well, you see, I mean, you've had that, you know, that ins into the camp as well. And so, you know, you're the best person to ask about their ability to, 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 to do that, to actually be serious when they need to and switch off when they need to. And I just wonder whether or not that's something that the All Blacks, because of what we were just discussing, may have lost. Uh, you know, this morning, you know, the All Blacks lost, oh, sorry, the All Blacks beat Scotland. I mean, just about, I mean, we, you know, we came back. But, you know, again, it was just one of those uninspired kind of performances. And, and I'm left here after the weekend thinking, well, the big rugby buzz for me wasn't, you know, us beating Scotland. I mean, you know, and I hate to say that out loud, but it just isn't. And it wasn't, you know. I mean, the big buzz is actually this. So, okay, I obviously want to get on to where we go from here. But let's just look at the breakdown of that actual final. At 14 nil, when they had 15 players on the field, I was really worried, Mel. I thought, how the hell are we going to stop this? Because every time they got the ball and they did that bloody boring rolling ball, they scored a try. Yeah, yeah, but one thing um, to note during that match is the Black Ferns game plan was about setting up a couple of midfield rucks, and then they were, had identified that when that happens, the English defence gets quite skinny, and there's always a gap outside the centre area, and usually it's Fords out there. Mm, um, mm. Stand out. So that game plan was very much designed to take advantage of the fact that the English um, defenders would get sucked in close because that is the kind of attack that they are used to defending and that's certainly what they defended in, in the semi-final against Canada. So that was extremely um, astute. Also saw uh, the positioning of the back three with the Black Fern. Again, they've uh, done their homework. This is Graham Henry input here. And they had the back three standing deep the whole time, also having the first five drop back. So not once did that uh, English um, kicking game actually dominate like they have against the other teams because you had players there to receive the ball. And then when they counter-attacked, they'd either go open or they'd switch back blind, much like Ben Smith used to do when he played for the All Blacks. So that puts the English defence under duress as well. Uh, the quick tap game behind the 22 had all these blokes going, oh my God, why are they doing that? They should be doing this. Well, that's how the Black Ferns play. And they did actually make some tackle breaks because they make on average 38 tackle breaks a game. So of course they're going to back themselves to take them on um, when it came to um, in, in having the ball in hand. So everything about what they did was actually a masterclass. Um, and it would have been a nightmare if, well, a disappointment, I should say, if a team won the World Cup from rolling balls. And Marty, just one more point. Remember how I said to you how you defend the rolling ball and there were three or four different tactics you could put against them and that the bravest was to go up and try and compete in the air and you could only do it a couple of times a match. That was Wayne Smith's call to Jonah Nawu, who had the guts to get up and put her hand in front of Appy Dow to yeah. get that last ball and stop yeah. them from getting a try. That was poetry in motion watching that oh, bravery. Look, I tell you, you know, because I was, that was right in the corner where I was, okay? And so you looked at that, you looked at the clock, you heard the hoot it, and you just said, oh, my God, I've watched this too many times before. And, I, you know, and we have. Yeah. We've watched Heartbreak and World Cups before. We've seen it. And, you know, it yeah. was almost like in slow motion. And then you see a black jerseyed arm go up. It was like, oh, my God, it was like something from heaven, wasn't it? It was just, that's the moment of the match to me. And well, it was. And, and do you know what England did? They went for the money ball up at two. They should have stuck to going back to, to the back jumper where they'd been successful with this entire World Cup. But because it was the World Cup, they had pressure on them. They went straight up in two, and that is how Jonah Nunwoo was able to get in front of the jumper. So um, England were not brave. New Zealand were, and a, a great result for the big fans there. That was amazing. Melody Robinson, well, the standard of the rugby, the quality of the rugby. I know it's difficult to compare when you were playing, but I'm even going back to 2017. You know, I hope that people people aren't saying, hey, this is a, a massive league. We were a damn good side in 2017. We were a really good side when you were playing too, Mel. I mean, I don't think that, you know, rugby absolutely accelerates itself in a, in a matter of years. But what's happened here is that a hell of a lot more people have actually got to see how good this team can be. Yeah, that's right. Um, the last time, or the record win that New Zealand had over England was 57-0 back in 1997. And guess who was coaching? Uh, the Black Ferns as one of the coaches in, in that year. That was Wayne Smith. Um, so he started to instill that attacking, manipulate the defence uh, attack um, mindset way back in 1997, um, and then they went through to win 98 very, very well 
as well. In 2017, um, it was slightly a uh, slightly different game plan. They definitely um, probably ran across the field rather than attacking straight through where the last um, rucks are, but they still had the power players um, who got some incredible tries, like um, Toko, um, the prop, who went over for three uh, in that second half, and they came from behind. So it was a, that was another great story too. But this one was just because it was against the odds. They'd been thrashed by England and France, you know, less than 12 months before, um, and it was redemption. So the question is, what is next? Yeah. From New Zealand yeah. rugby perspective, yeah. to keep yeah. on this way. Yeah. yeah. Look, and you know, um, and I've written an article for NBR this week, and you know, it's not meant to be provocative at all, but the you know the the you know the title is can women's rugby be financially sustainable? And my answer to that is not right at this point in time, no. But that doesn't mean it can't be. But what we've got to do is be really thoughtful, intelligent, smart and figure this out because it doesn't need to be right at the moment. It's got the funding there. But look, all rugby in New Zealand is actually suffering a bit. You see the MPC crowds aren't there, right? The Farah Palmer Cup crowds weren't there. But somehow Mm. you've now got a shop which has attracted all of these customers in it. You've got a great front window in that shop and so the brains have really got to figure this thing out. It's not about throwing money at it, Mel. I mean, you know, that to me is only one aspect to it. You've actually got to have a real plan in place of how, how to maximise and capitalise on this. You know, and that's going to take a commitment from all of those brains at New Zealand Rugby. And I, I mean, I don't have a lot of confidence at the moment, but I actually think that, you know, this is the next step, isn't it? How the hell to actually keep this going? Well, if you had a consultant from... Um EY come in and examine why that was successful. It's because they got the the customer experience right, or Brilliant. the value yeah. Yeah. The value for the customer. Yeah. So the food trucks out the back. Um, so there was a variety of food, so it just wasn't the, the same old caterers that you usually get at the Super Rugby game at Eden Park. Uh, they had the music, so it turned it into an event rather than just a sports game. Um, created some really big personalities. There was the coverage from the media, which had it front of mind um, from people. There were also passionate people who were there because they gave us stuff about the women's sport movement. So lots of different things. Plus free-to-air. Plus the free-to-air. Yeah, free-to-air, massive, absolutely massive, making it accessible. So I don't think it's difficult. What it just suggests to people uh, um, at New Zealand Rugby is you've got to innovate, you've got to innovate around your, your event, your product and make sure that you have the um, audience in the middle of that, which is something they've said for a long time. But they're tied into contracts um, with Eden Park, for instance, or Eden Park are tied into catering and, um, you know, big stadiums like that. So they limit themselves on how they can actually put an event together. But that showed you can do it. Bring in the music, bring in the bits and pieces around it, um, and you're actually, I guess, a, a step forward. New Zealand Rugby Union probably need to figure out a few things here and have a really big sit down because three of the coaches won't be with the Black Ferns yeah, um, yeah. season. So, you know, what's their what is their process around appointments? Let's hope some really good um, coaches put their hands up as well as the mix that we have there in the system already. Um, who's going to take over the high performance program? Hannah Porter, who's in charge of that, is the band aid. She's loaned from New Zealand um, Sport. She won't be doing that. So, who's going to take over the high performance program? What resource will you put at the community game? Because right, currently you've only got one woman in charge of that at New Zealand Rugby, and that is too much of a big, big job if you're really looking to focus on kids and girls at school. And how about thinking outside the box and getting some uh, investment, um, um, I guess, um, prizes or, or you know, um, uh, encouragement to schools to make sure that their junior and also school girl competitions are running well. So I put some money into that area to help with that too. So there's a lot of work for them to do. Um, They've got to do a heap and they've got to do it now and get on the wave of women's rugby. Because what you don't want to see is you don't want to see what, you know, New Zealand football failed to do after 81, 82 and and 2010. Ah. And we've seen... We've seen so many sports, you know, climb the sporting love tree in New Zealand. You know, the canoeing with Lisa Carrington. You've got Dame Valley. All of these sports, hockey. I, you yeah. know, I, you know I, I remember the 2000 um, Olympics with Mandy Smith's team getting a million people on TV and Z watching. You've had netball with massive audiences on uh, TV and Z, yeah. you know, and none of these sports have managed to capitalise on it. The other question I've got might be a cheeky question is, you know, rugby's ingrained as, a, as, as our national sport. I mean, you know, are the, are the men prepared to share the stage? Not the whole time. The All Blacks are our number one team. I know that. But are they prepared to share that stage? They always, they always have. The, um, from the time I was playing, they were there watching us in the curtain raises, supporting us, and were ne- never, ever 
had a question in their brains that we weren't part of. Oh, it's great. Um, okay. Their whole story. Yeah, yep. Look, and you know, you saw that Dan Carter, Conrad Smith has been at pretty much uh, every Black Fern game and, and is hugely supportive. He works for the International Rugby Players Association. Um, I guess where the, the support from the players is actually at the Players Association level at the different national unions. So International Rugby Players um, has got Rachel Burford leading that piece of work and a very supportive board there with Conrad Smith as part of that and Rob Nicol. Um, New Zealand Rugby uh, Players Association have 100% been there in negotiating the women's contracts, which is why the Black Fern squad have got very, very good contracts around them. Australia Rugby Union, here's a good example for you, do not have any representation on their Players Association for the female players. So from what I understand, World Rugby will start to um, consider giving funding to national um, associations which are specifically coined to the women's game to help that support. So um, it's the past players that probably need to help in that area with them. Thank you so much again for so much time. Brilliant ideas. I hope they shoulder tap you actually because I mean I think you're the person that they need to actually have sitting on these committees and that because you've got all the experience and the knowledge there. But just again going back to it, yeah, isn't sport great? I mean the whole point of it is it's meant to make you happy, isn't it? It's meant to take your mind off all the shitty things that go on in your life and for a moment there you just lose yourself and that's what happened at Eden Park. And I haven't experienced that at a game of sport in New Zealand for a long time and I walked out of there high as a kite. You know what I mean? Absolutely, so did I, and that is why my throat is sore still on a Monday morning because I was yelling and screaming the whole time and did not stay still. I was walking backwards and forth. What a, it was amazing. Amazing. <laughs>